This FedGov Today program is sponsored by ComVault. On this edition of FedGov Today with Francis Rose, the AI edge that can turbocharge your agency's cyber defenses. You've got to start looking at some tasks and some controls that while automated, they're not dynamic. And what you want to be able to do is understand that AI can actually be proactive. Richard Brakeiron of Commvault on FedGov Today in just a moment. First, though, one D-O-T-I-T is the goal for the Transportation Department's Chief Information Officer. He lists processes, people, and products as part of the path to get to that goal. Pavan Padugu, the CIO at DOT, will tell you about it on the last FedGov Today TV we recorded before the shutdown started. You can watch the show on the FedGov Today YouTube channel anytime, and it's available on our website at fedgovtoday.com. The Pentagon will announce more zero-trust solutions for the department to choose from by the end of the year, according to the leader of the zero-trust office, Randy Resnick. Three solutions are already available. Richard Brakeiron's Director of Strategic Initiatives at Commvault. Richard, welcome. Thanks for joining me again. Uh, We'll talk about zero-trust in a moment, especially as it relates to the Pentagon. But before we went on the air, you reminded me that at RSA this year, a number of Fortune 100 companies kind of on their own, not connected to anything with the government, said, we're going to use the FedRAMP High framework for securing our systems. What's the significance of that as we get toward the end of this calendar year that these commercial companies with no vested interest in FedRAMP and no requirements to adhere to it have decided that it's a standard for them to to go along with? Welcome, Richard. Well, thank you so much. I really do appreciate the opportunity to, to talk on this subject. And, and, and so, as you just discussed, the Fortune 100 realize a couple of things, that they invest a lot of money into security equal in their mind relative to uh, the Pentagon. And what they are starting to realize is that often they are integrating these after the fact. And that is what they have all of a sudden looked at FedRAMP is they say, you know, FedRAMP and zero trust architecture. And let me underline that word architecture because architecture is telling you a requirement, just like FedRAMP is giving you a a set of controls. They are not telling you how you have to do it. They're just saying, if you want a comprehensive solution for operational readiness, and I emphasize again, operational as much as cyber readiness, and, and and obviously it's it's a Venn diagram, but but the key point is these industries have said if we start integrating security as we look at everything we are modernizing in all the ways as we digitally transform, it won't be a burden at the end. It actually will be a strategic advantage. And our CEO Sanjay Merchandi, he he brought up the same aspect of saying when he read the responses that we were giving, he also emphasized when you integrate security along the way, not a bolt on, not a duct tape ad, but as you are building your processes, as you streamline your processes, streamline the security measures as well. Look at roles-based control. Look at the automation that's coming along. So, so that's really the the premise for, for how we got there. there. There's a couple of pieces there that I want to pull the string on if we have time, Richard. But the first one, I think, is the most important one, and that is what you're describing. For a long time, agencies have said, we don't want to bolt on security at the end. So that's not new. Um, And a lot of agencies have started to think about through their zero trust efforts, how do we integrate security frameworks into our software? So that's, that's good, but it sounds like the net you're kind of taking this to the next uh, level. And so are these companies by saying we want to integrate security frameworks into our business processes and not just into the pieces or the applications that we use to drive those business processes. Does that, is that what I'm hearing you say? Absolutely correct. And and recognize the fact that they are recognizing that being ready at the time of a disaster event does not, you cannot start that when the disaster occurs. This is something the Pentagon has known for the longest time. And and this is why when, and, and, and I'll tell you, one of the key motivators in the last six, seven months has been Doge. And they are looking to say, listen, 
we believe you are missing the opportunity as you modernize to become more efficient. Let me give you an example. We had a major agency that in back in, you know, February, March, we had all this, they had a, a standard plan to upgrade their data storage protection and a whole bunch of other security measures. And when the Doge people did their review of it, they said, well, wait a minute. You are doing the same old thing. You're doing it on-prem again. You're not using a SaaS product. You're not using the cloud. You're not reducing other softwares and uh, other um, reducing number of people. And by the way, if Commvault's all that, if they're protecting Microsoft, as you were saying in your proposal here for us to review, why aren't they SaaS? Why aren't they secure? And and all of a sudden, we, we took that opportunity and said, wow, perfect. We are SaaS. We're FedRAMP high. We integrate security from the outset. And by the way, here are so many other software licenses you could remove, and here are the people you can save. But more importantly, we focus on the upfront executive summary, which was if you start looking at operational readiness and businesses process from a people, process, and technology from an efficiency standpoint, recognizing data is the blood, the lifeblood of today's digital world, you are going to be so far ahead. You're going to have a strategic advantage finally over your adversary because it's not an afterthought. And by the way, it changes your culture too. And that's another critical uh, point. All right. You want people to be thinking secure at the outset. Yeah, we'll come back to the culture piece. Yeah, no, that's okay. That's that's what you're here for. We'll come back to the culture piece in a moment because that's important in all of these issues and I think sometimes gets overlooked. But you really, really, really emphasized the word architecture earlier in our conversation. And I wonder what you've seen to be the biggest roadblocks, especially in public sector organizations, architecture-wise, to that idea of integrating security frameworks into business processes and not just into the applications that support those business processes? So that's a great, great uh, question. And and so again, I think the reason public sector and even industry sometimes sort of pushes back on that word architecture is they all of a sudden think of, okay, a, a blueprint that has to have so much detail to it and everybody's mind starts so insane. Well, I don't, I, I don't know all those things. But if you just remind them, hey, the architecture is, and the best example I always give is, I'm in a hospital. I have an individual um, healthcare provider that has got to move a person on a gurney, and they've got to move through a hospital that has lots of locked doors, but I need them to work automatically. What architecture is saying is that's the requirement. That's what we want people to bring their minds up out of the detail and say, now you get to... Uh, pick the right solution for you. Do you want it to be a video camera that sees somebody coming and opens the door? Do you want it on the floor? Do you want a near field communication that's tied to somebody's badge that is, is neat to be able to do? So when you think about architecture, I keep coming back to, no, 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 no. And and the zero trust architecture is written this way. As a matter of fact, I, I was on a, a meeting with Microsoft the other day and they said, you know, this is really a bunch of nebulous requirements. They're not telling you, you have to use this, that, or the other thing. They're just saying you have got to do identity management. How you do identity management in a virtual world there's a thousand different ways in today's automated world. So here is the neat part for me. You get to present, let us show you the architecture and why you're looking at the architecture, because notice the zero trust architecture has a minimal and an optimal look that you can maybe start integrating the capability going forward to have a more dynamic. Let me give you the TSA example. How many times have you gone through TSA over the last 20 years and it's gone from very slow, very personal with that agent and yourself to now you step in front of a little laptop, it scans your picture, they read your gold star ID. So notice technology at the state level and the federal level and all of a sudden greater efficiency, it's faster, it's more secure. And when you get on that flight, you should feel a lot more comfortable about that process. But by integrating that dynamic, by keeping people thinking about the business process, the process is to properly screen people. And notice how all of a sudden you can modernize in a very secure fashion. Does that, does that make sense? It does make sense. And it takes me to the next point, which is, 
what what are the ways whether it's the technology or the process or the people what are the ways to tie all of this together if we're going to think about this in a different way now that that next level that i alluded to earlier how does that tie all together then and does it do so differently since we're approaching it differently Absolutely. And, and another great, great question. And and just coming out of a conference yesterday where uh, the Library of Congress, the director for uh, AI, spoke specifically to that. And she commented on the fact that people should understand that AI is actually going to help you finally tie people, process, and technology. But more importantly, and I love this frame that the framework that she put on it, that AI actually is that algorithm to allow people to be compressed. So, in other words, you can now bring a lot of people that have had to do and rely on administrative support. An AI agent can help somebody have that done in an integrated way across the organization. So when you're building your security analysis and you're looking at supply management, you can automatically get a cue from an AI agent that says, hey, you're using these other two companies. Are you sure they're secure? Do you have their certificates for their security? And it's, again, not an afterthought. So that is really uh, where I see it. Now, the other part that I thought... um, Uh, She presented very, very well yesterday, and that was the fact that um, at the highest level of subject matter expertise, there are jobs in the Library of Congress where they have analysts that are so specific that AI will help them take care of the admin but it cannot help them do the nuanced job. And I go this, uh, I gave to her as an example. So it's the idea of knowing how to build a rope bridge across a 300 foot fall chasm and building it yourself and then walking across it yourself. Those are two totally different things. There's a ton here I would love to cover, but I only have time for one more question. And that is, does the introduction sure. of artificial intelligence to this equation, Richard, require people to think about architecture differently or is it just kind of plug and play given that people should already have been building something in the way that we've been talking about in this conversation so i think there is a good dynamic where people are going to have to understand that ai is an agent that helps you and so you've got to start looking at some tasks and some controls that while automated they're not dynamic and what you want to be able to do is understand that ai can actually be proactive and and i gave that example of hey when you're doing your supply chain risk management it As long as it knows about other things that are potential threats, that's where it can really start helping you. And and so that would be the only part I would say is that there are a lot of nuances in everything that we do in any business. Uh, I don't care if you're uh, an airline pilot or if you're a uh, mail person delivery. There are nuances here that you just have to make sure that your workforce is Again, that people is informing the process as the technology is being integrated to give it that ability to be dynamic. So that would be the the big point I would end with. uh, It's always great to catch up with you, Richard. I learn something every time, and it's great to have you on the program again. Thanks for joining me. Oh, I really appreciate it, and thank you all. You can read more about cybersecurity on today's show page at fedgovtoday.com. The FedGov Today podcast returns tomorrow. You may be managing a mix of accepted and furloughed employees when the government reopens. You'll get some advice on how to do it from former GSA Administrator Emily Murphy on tomorrow's FedGov Today podcast. If you don't want to miss that, you can follow the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, on the FedGov Today YouTube channel, or on demand at FedGovToday.com. I'm Francis Rose. Talk to you then. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.